chapter. The name of this one is Acceptance and the Son. Acceptance and the Son. And the first thing, one of the main points he brings out at the beginning of this is that we need to understand that salvation is a person. Redemption is a person. It is not a system. It's a person. And that's extremely important. And Paul writes to Timothy, and within this scripture, he, he, he shows just in the writing of the scripture how important it is. 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 7 says this, For there is one God, one mediator, who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. And I have been chosen as a preacher, Paul was saying, and an apostle to teach the Gentiles the message about faith and truth. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not lying, he says. I'm just telling you the truth. But the point, some of the translations up at the beginning when it says God and humanity, the man Christ, some translations will say a man Christ, but it's better translated the man. For the reasons of that he, he is being specific that Jesus Christ is a man just like us. He was born of the flesh. Not just any man, but it was Jesus Christ the man that was also God. God the Son, part of the triune, God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But he was also 100% man. It's extremely important because our salvation, our redemption rests on the shoulders, on the cross, on the death, and on the resurrection of a man, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth. It's not a system. It's not a sacrificial system. It's not a burnt offering system. It's not any kind of system. It is a man. And that is very important. For centuries, and he talks about this in the book too, if you're familiar with the arguments from the two great theologians, Calvin and the Arminians, one is more of a works-based or is totally up to you, you choose God or you don't choose God. And Calvin's, no, it's not like that. God chooses you and that's how it goes. And that's just the way it is. And so it's back and forth and go back and forth. But if you remove anything that involves a system and replace it with the man Jesus Christ, all of those arguments seem to fade away. They're not there. When it's just Jesus, the man, the sacrifice, and our faith in Him, and our sins are washed away, that makes it not as much of an argument and so many other things within scripture begins to make sense whenever we grasp that one of the second things i think that is one of the highlights is that we talk about deliverance we talk about freedom from sin and forgiveness of sin past present and future past present and future there are some people that when you talk about all the sins that you will commit has been forgiven and they, they they liable to want to fight with you maybe somebody in here I mean, it kind of feels that way please don't do that i really don't feel like a fight. i don't feel like going to the hospital tonight no i'm just kidding but that's how it gets sometimes within our religious system on the beliefs about certain things hebrews 7 25 says therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him, the man, Jesus Christ. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. The word there that they're talking about that is forever, and you'll be able to read about this in your book, is pentelus. It is the word that they use for forever in some translations it's different but that word actually means all in respect of time all the time all the way 
to the very end, completely. So therefore, He is able once and forever, all the way to the end, completely, everything that you'll ever do to save those who come to God through Him. That's powerful. Dr. Ekman uses a great analogy when he's discussing this. We're often referred to as sheep in the Scripture, right? Many times, right? And you've heard the reason why. Because sheep are dumb. They're going to follow other sheep. Even off a cliff. They don't know that the wolf's coming to get them. They're just eating grass and drinking water. Right? That's why we're referred to as sheep. And he says, and I never thought about this before either. If we are not continually getting lost or going astray, we don't qualify to have a shepherd. We don't qualify to have somebody that is protecting us at all times and at all cost. Let that sink in for a minute. That's Dr. Ekman's take on that scripture. And it makes a whole lot of sense because we're referred to sheep all the time. And Jesus has some wonderful perils, par parables. He, he had some perils too, but we, he had these parables that talked about if one sheep goes astray, what was he going to do to go get that sheep? He was going to go get the sheep. Paul writes, I think it's in Romans, all we like sheep have gone astray. We're continually used in respect of an animal that lives a certain way and requires a shepherd for the entire length of his life. That begins to put in perspective the man, Jesus Christ, who is considered and called our great shepherd. Do we need a shepherd? Yes. Are we going to need him tomorrow? Let's be honest. Yes. And he's bearing this out in the scripture. The writer of Hebrews is bringing that out without saying it. But he's talking about the shepherd who will be there today and for always to protect the sheep, <coughs> save the sheep, go find the sheep, and keep the sheep safe. Amen? I find a lot of comfort in that. I hope you do. The third thing is that salvation, our salvation, our redemption, actually pleases God. It pleases God. God is happy and excited that you have put your faith in Him. Any of you ever had the experiences, even maybe when you were younger, that that's what you thought about God on the day that you gave your heart to Him? But subsequent messages after that made you feel like now He's after you. Right? Right? Maybe. He is pleased. Ephesians 1.5 says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Ephesians 1.5. And it gave him great pleasure pleasure. Matthew 12, 18. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You remember when he said that? Anybody remember? When he was getting ready to be baptized. What was getting ready to happen right after the baptism? He was getting ready to go spend 40 days in the wilderness. It was just the beginning of his ministry was really the beginning of leading up to his death. 
And because Jesus was doing the will of the Father that he was going to be crushed, this is my son, the man in whom I am well pleased. Isaiah 53.10 in his prophecy about the lamb being slain, the man, Jesus Christ, says it delighted God to crush him. I don't know about you, but I mean, I've read that scripture over the years. I've heard it read most of my life. And we go right by it sometimes. But we can't move past the point of a father-son relationship. And the son says here that it pleased God that his son, the man, would be crushed for you and I. It, it's hard for us to understand that. And I don't know that we would ever be able to fully understand that, no matter what, no matter who was standing up here trying to explain it. Love always overlooks pain to benefit others. That's what love is. One of the scriptures says, true love is this, that a man would lay his life down for his friend. A man, a man would lay his life down for his friend. Love always overlooks pain to benefit others. Ephesians 1 9 says, Having made known to us the mystery of his settled desire, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in relationship to him. If God is enjoying this, if he was pleased with Christ, if he is looking down and going, this is exactly what I designed from the very beginning because I knew they would be lost. If he is looking down and he is enjoying it, says he had pleasure that his son was crushed so that we could be brought back into his family. If God is enjoying that, why aren't we living in some type of joy and happiness as his children? Shouldn't we? So the next thing is, salvation should please the believer. If it does not, then why? If it does not, then why? And I, every one of us in here, we've had good days and we've had bad days. And sometimes we feel like we can conquer the world, and other days we feel like the world's right on top of us. There's those of us in here that experienced horrible grief, horrible pain. You may be in the middle of it even right now. But there are, it is available, it is an opportunity for us to be able to find a place in God where we can have joy, true joy, where we can have peace, where we can have happiness. That doesn't mean everything's going to go perfectly because remember, we're sheep. <laughs> we're going to have some issues along the way, but we have a man, a God-man that is sitting at the right hand of the Father, the Bible says, and he is our intercessor. He is our shepherd. So, one of the things that come up next, and I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about these because this was, I don't know why, this was kind of like newer information to me. And I think this is related to how we operate within our salvation and within redemption. Five kinds of consciousness. Five kinds of consciousness is talked about in the New Testament. A healthy conscience, a burned out conscience, a weak conscience, a strong conscience, and an evil conscience. So I would encourage you, even after tonight, I've already talked about it, even after tonight, as you're going through this, Spend some time in this book, but really engage yourself, especially when it's talking about 
the conscience. Where I'm at is on page 53, and you can begin to look at it a little more because this was, this was so eye-opening to me. So I'm just going to read a little bit. I'm going I'm to talk more about the evil conscience tonight before we go into discussion. Um, but there's a lot here. So I'm just going to read some of this and, and maybe talk about it, offer a little commentary on it. The conscience is the guardian of your subconscious beliefs. With the quickness of a computer, it instantly tells us when we have violated our subconscious beliefs. Comparing what we do with what we sincerely believe, the conscience will allow us to feel good if they match, and if no match exists, we'll feel deep, emotional, either powerful, destructive, or scandalizing, or wounding pain. If it matches what our belief system is within our subconscious, then it may be great feeling for you. But if it don't, no matter what it is, then it may be horrible, it may be painful, it may make you feel like you've been scandalized. There's a whole lot of things. Notice the Hebrew 10, 1930 describes how a Christian is supposed to protect himself from his evil conscience. That's what it says. We should enter with a true heart and a fullness of positive feelings from faith, having permanently sprinkled our hearts from an evil conscience and washed our bodies in pure water. That's Hebrews 10, 22. That is the New Living Translation. And I have looked at that. That It's basically saying exactly what that translation is saying. There's a whole lot more there, so it's well worth your study. We are to come to God with a true heart overflowing with our confidence from the faith that we have in Him. We are to come to Him with a true heart, with our confidence and our faith in Him overflowing. We're supposed to come into the presence of God with full assurance, with a solid foundation of our positive emotions that comes from our faith. So what is an evil conscience? Evil conscience is talked about in Romans 10. The word there is paneris. I, I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing that. But it's the same word that Jesus used in the Lord's Prayer describing Satan. So where does an evil conscience come from? I'm not going to stand up here and tell you exactly where that comes from. But he offers some scripture and some things in here where he feels that at part that is working against us, working against our redemption, even working against Christ at times, where some of that can come from, may come from. And pride always plays a large part in something like this as well. So I'm going to read here. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make perfect those who are drawn to it. So if you look at the context on who Paul was writing to, he's writing to the Hebrews. He's writing to the Christians that have been Jews, that have been part of the Hebrew nation, that has gone up to do sacrifices once a year, once a week. They watch the bulls being killed. They watch the, them being burnt, the blood, and all of that other stuff. And Paul is writing to them because they have already received the person Jesus Christ They've already put their faith in him and they've possibly been walking with Jesus for several years, but he finds that they're still participating in the animal sacrifices. So that's the context 
of Hebrews 10. Because of this custom, they assume that it was Christ and your faith in Him plus blood sacrifice. Christ plus some of the other stuff that they were doing. This is the context that Paul is writing to the Hebrew Christians. You've put your faith in Jesus Christ, but you're continually going and you have to know that the blood of bulls and goats is not going to do anything more than what the person Jesus Christ and His blood has done for you. You've been washed now and forever. It's senseless to continue in this. That's the context. That's what he's writing. Verse 10 says, Paul writes, We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Verse 14, For by one offering he has perfected for all time your sanctification. Verse 19, Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin especially animal sacrifice. That's what he's talking about. So when we take that into context of what Paul is writing to them, do you think that they were there trying to do something evil? No. That's what they had in their mind. That's what they had all, always done. So that's what they continue to do. So Paul's trying to correct that. I've been to India three different times. We have a, an orphanage over there that we support. And I met a, a guy from India years ago when I was in college. And so it, it, it's been something that, that we've tried to do. And I've been there and I've preached there. So one of the most interesting things that I find out from people that are saved out of the Hindu religion. So to give you the context, so we're... I'm, I'm preaching in a field one day and there's a stage there and there's probably 10,000 people gathered in this. I'm not the only one, but there's, I mean, they're small. You can get 10,000 people in a really small area that you might not think about. And so afterwards, they, they are amazed when white people come over there to preach. Some of them never even seen white people, especially Americans. That That, that is... They think that is just like, it's hard to explain. But my friend Joe T was explaining it to me. So afterwards, they all want to be prayed for. They all want somebody, they all want a white American Christian to lay his hands on them and pray for them and to pray over their oil. Their oil. I was dripping with oil by the end of that. It was, it was different. So what happens in, in Hinduism, they believe in many gods, many gods. So one of the main things they do is anoint their house, their shacks, whatever it is they live in, they constantly anoint it. They constantly go to the Hindu priest, they bless their oil, they go back home, and everything is anointed, and that's how that was part of their religion. They bring that into Christianity. Is it right? Is it biblical? No. No. And he's working with them to bring them through that. They're not doing it out of a bad place, out of an evil intent. That is what they've known. They, were, they, were, they grew up in Hinduism. And so he is working through that, discipling them. It's a process. And that's what Paul was doing with them. He's teaching them a process. So believers today might have had their conscience or your conscience trained the way the Hebrew believers were trained. But it might not be with sacrificial bulls. And it might not be with oil. Our conscience might have been trained by a long list of religious works, good deeds, depending on what church you grew up in or what you were trained, or how you were trained, or if you were part of some cult, or if you weren't, but you had a, a, maybe a tough daddy, or a tough mama, or maybe a school teacher, or somebody else, or somebody has placed something within you that taught you something on the inside 
that just don't seem to jihad with the word of God and your redemption, but you're trying to work it out. But each time somebody says something, that conscience inside says, no, something's wrong there, something's wrong there. And if we're not careful, this is where our pride comes in. Because guys, most of the time we don't like somebody doing everything for us. We've got to know what's happening. I want to schedule. I know what I can do because I'm going to contribute to it, right? Sometimes we can be sick and hurting and we don't want nobody to know because we don't want nobody. They don't have to bring us soup. They don't have to do nothing. I'm fine. I, I can get by, right? So if we're the sheep out there, we're like, I'll take on the wolf. That's, I mean, that's how we are, right? We can do it ourselves. We don't want nobody else to have to do it. And here is Jesus Christ, the man, saying, you can't do anything to get your sins forgiven. Nothing. Not a bull, not oil. You can't work enough out. You can't do it. I have to do it for you. It's the only way. You have to surrender everything. You have to come. Stop sacrificing the animals. They don't work anymore. I changed all that. This is all that it requires. And our mind and our hearts telling us that's not what the preacher said when I was little. That's not what I heard. That's not what this have. This, this, this don't seem right. Something's going on right here. That, if it works against the freedom and the power of the man Jesus Christ and his redemption, then we are dealing with what he describes and Paul describes as an evil conscience. That's tough. But it's true. And I would imagine that a lot of us in this room, we've dealt with this. Ever since we got old enough to think for ourselves and begin to parse through the scriptures, or maybe you just recently got saved and maybe you have no idea what I'm talking about. Glory be for you if you're not having a deal. If you grew up in the South, you probably got a little bit of evil conscience going on about things. Christ plus witnessing. Witnessing's a good thing. We need to go out. We need to witness. We need to live that. But does your, does your salvation, does your redemption depend on you going out witnessing? Does your salvation in your own mind depend that you get up every day and read so many chapters in the Bible? Or stroke a rosary bead? Or to go to mass two or three times a week or to go to confessional or to make sure you don't miss the 915 service so you can go to the 1115 service too so you got two in so you don't have to go again for a couple of weeks. I'm saying that kind of joking, but that's the kind of crap we carry around inside of us. And soon as some preacher gets up there and talks about freedom and joy and peace, you're thinking... Where in the Hades does that come from? Not in my experience with the Lord. We got to have works. You got to give. You got to tithe. Man, if, you, if you don't tithe, well, you're going to hell. Is that true? Not according to the man that sacrificed his life for us. Not according to the scripture. Your salvation, your redemption, your forgiveness of your sins tonight and forevermore depends only on your faith in the man Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. That's what I believe. And that's the way we need to live. It's not Christ plus anything. Not Christ plus anything anything he uses this example right here if I walked up to a man that had just given his son to die for me and said you know what that was a really good gesture you know giving your son but I know I need to give some small change because i that quite, didn't quite do it. I'm going to have to pay a little bit. I understand that. 
Uh, giving your son, uh, that was all well and good, but that's not going to completely do it for me. I don't, I'm not feeling that. As a daddy, how would you feel? That's exactly what God is saying. That's exactly what God is saying. And Paul come just about as close to really getting frustrated with them Hebrews as he could right there. When he said, you can't, you don't need to, you shouldn't. No blood of bulls or goats was going to do anything because the blood of Jesus Christ has done it all. And we still carry that, and I'll guarantee you they still carry that in their conscience for a while. It was so hard for them. I mean, that's why you see a lot of that back and forth with Paul in the Scriptures and with Peter. They just, they, they, it took a while for them to grasp that. I don't know what it's going to take for all of us to get to the place where we can live in freedom of the chains that still bind us when the blood of Jesus Christ took everything. It's available, and if it's available, I want it. And I want you to have it. And I believe with all my heart that's what God is calling us to. He's opening these scriptures up to us so that we can move forward in this. Do you see the power in this? Do you see the power in this? There is power. There is power in us cleansing our conscience before God. And I look back on my own life and I wonder sometimes even stuff that I've preached in the past or taught in the past, if I was even pleasing Him when I thought for a moment that it required anything else but the blood of Jesus Christ for salvation. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God. Lord, I pray that these words honor you tonight and honor your son Jesus Christ for what he did. I can't imagine it, but that's what your word says. You loved us enough to do that. Why in the world would we want to add anything else to it? Lord, let us find that place where we can get before you and, and, and just humble ourselves and allow you through the work of your Holy Spirit to begin to cleanse us of these, of these conscious things, Lord, that keep us bound, that keeps chains on our heart, on our soul, on our lives that keeps us from living in freedom, living in, in total abandon for you and with you. You promised that, Holy God. I pray every man in this room begins to move in that direction, Holy God, so that we will grasp that life that you make available for us. And if people look in and they see and they want and desire what we have, because we live in such love and such comfort and such peace for you. Lord, we give you the praise for everything. In the name of Jesus, amen.